before I start, is there going to be a break or are we going all the way through? I just didn't remember if there was anything on the... We're going right through. You're going to make everybody just sit there? Yes, sir. Okay, he said it, not They're me. They're engaged. Okay, just, so, just so you all know. All right. Okay, five minutes. Not, uh, not a lot of uh, time. Uh, I did... <laughs> I, I think what I was saying about the ship analogy was fairly straightforward. Uh, and that is the problem with the ship analogy is that you have people who want to be saved and God's a big, mean, man, bad God if he doesn't save them. The ship analogy is not biblical. There is no one splashing around the water saying, save me. They are rebels against God, going against God, spitting in his face. That's the whole point. There is nothing unjust about God allowing rebels who hate him to remain in their sin. The wonder is that he took any of us and changed us. He says he's emptied the scripture of all warnings. No, the warnings are the method that God used for us to hear his voice. That's what they're there for. We hear them. Since we have spiritual life, we obey. They do, however, also increase the guiltiness of those who spit in God's face. Just take a little trip over to San Francisco or, sadly, in our own area around here to see how people like to spit in the face of God's warnings in the Scripture. There is a misunderstanding of the term autonomous here. When I'm talking about autonomous free will, I'm talking about a free will that acts outside of God's decree determining its action. And I think that's what Dr. Sengenis was talking about. He needs to clarify that. He said, if Dr. White can show us a verse that says that, no man, that a man does not have free will, he wins. I gave you a bunch of them, but let's review just one of them. Uh, and that is Romans chapter 8. Once again, listen to the words. Because the mind's on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. There it is. It is not able to do so. There you go. You can talk about prevenient grace all you want. You can have, have a good time trying to find that term in the New Testament. It's not there, but... The fact of the matter is that outside of God's grace, and it's the salvific grace, man is not able to subject himself to the law of God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, it's being said, well, yes, but God's grace come along, comes along and makes you able to do so, and then you can get to choose one way or the other. Where does, where does Paul say that? Where does the scripture say that? I'd like to see that. Very, very common. It just simply isn't a biblical teaching. Uh, he said that I've read out of John 6, uh, that I, I have read into John 6.44 because of my Calvinistic programming. Well, uh, there are two backgrounds up here uh, right now. And obviously, from my perspective, what we're seeing is the eisegesis that results from fidelity to Roman Catholicism and its claims. Uh, I just simply let you choose to see that. I let you see that by the argumentation. The fact of the matter is, though, that what Dr. Syngenis has ignored in his comments on John 6 is that Jesus is explaining the unbelief of people. He's looking at Jews and saying, yet you are unbelievers, and then he explains why they're unbelievers, because they have not been given to him by the Father. That's why they will not come to him. And remember, at the end of John 6, everybody but the 12 walk away. And Jesus doesn't go after them and say, oh, you misunderstood. No, Jesus knows what's in the hearts of men. And so I'm not reading anything into John 6, 44 because he says, well, it's just simply saying this. Folks, think about something. What does John 6, 44 say? No man is able to come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And what? I will raise him up on the last day. What does that mean? That's receiving salvation. We are talking about who is and who is not going to receive salvation here. And the one who receives salvation is the individual who is given by the Father to the Son. The action of giving precedes that of coming. The position being said here, well, we don't know what the basis of this giving is. Yes, we do. Ephesians 1.6, the, 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 the good intention of his, own, of his own will. It's right there. But the point is that our action flows from that divine sovereignty. And so I'm not reading anything into John 6.44. May I suggest that Dr. Sengenis is reading out of John 6.44 the tremendous meaning that it carries when we follow the argument through point by point and allow the terms to define themselves. And so once again, what does Romans 8 tell us? It tells us 
that no man is able to do what is pleasing to God. Any meaningful definition of free will would say that man is capable of doing so. Therefore, on the basis of Dr. Zanis' own statement, the debate is decided by that text. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Zanis, five-minute rebuttal, please. 